Ain't no better way to better yourself in this game. You're feeling the growth. It's, it's time on the mat. We put in the work. Believe it ain't easy, I know. But we train for the love of the game, the love of the art. Now slap it up, up and let's roll. Welcome to episode 5 of the BJJ Campaign Podcast. My name is Jeff Boone. I'm an A3, blue belt, no stripes. And this is Philip Boris. I'm an A2, white belt, three stripes. Very good, Philip. Can't get better. And we've got a special guest with us today. This is our first guest. Pretty excited about this podcast, to be honest with you. This is our general in our campaign with jiu-jitsu. Professor John Plyler, Fight to Win Denver who Phil and I have trained with uh, since we began our Jiu-Jitsu campaign. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jeff. What's happening, guys? Not Appreciate much. you having me on. And we need to uh, clarify, because every time we introduce someone, we want to know their key size. I, mean, I do it wrong. It's all right. It's all right. That's what we're here for. That's how I do it wrong every time. So, A3L. Oh, a long in there. Yes, <laughs> he does have long limbs, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, black belt, one stripe. One stripe. Got that one stripe. And you sew on your stripes, right? Yeah, they're going to be on that belt for a little while, so I don't see that belt changing anytime soon. So. <laughs> Probably Not a good well. idea. <laughs> Probably a good idea. So thanks for being here. Really appreciate it today. We're going to talk about some of the things um, that Phil and I don't have experience with, right? It's... Well, maybe we do have experience. Some of the things that can annoy your professor. Right. Right? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm sure we'll get into a few things where we'll be like, oh, yeah, okay, well, good to know. I do that. Uh, <laughs> so, so just just looking to John, John, what, you know, I know you, I think you've even written a blog post on it uh, at one point or another. On we may have touched on some of these. Um, yeah, we started talking about, you know, ideas for the uh, for the show and you know one of the things that I uh, said might be interesting to discuss is some of the well started out as top 10 things right that drive your instructor crazy went um, right through that didn't you? <laughs> just started jotting a few things down off the top of my head I think we're probably closer to 20 at this point but who's counting um, but really uh, you know a lot of these are going to be um, kind of universal probably for most most academies, most instructors, um, some may be more kind of personal pet peeves, but, um, you know, that was the way I kind of initially approached this, but really, um, probably a better way is, is, um, things that students, especially new students, um, may want to just be aware of that they, you know, may not even realize, um, because all of these things, um, you know, are very common and there's, a good reason for all of these uh, these different issues um, that uh, may annoy your your uh, professor. Um, so what's so the what's the what's the top what's the so top way to really get you got it though? Well, these uh, we can you know start to hit on some of these and and they're in no particular order. But um, but like I said, uh, you know, really this is more about what things that you can avoid in order to make yourself more successful. So maybe phrase it like that rather than, um, you know, what drives your instructor crazy. They do drive your instructor crazy. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, for sure. No, um, we definitely want the positive. So, so one, um, you know, just, uh, this is one that I'm, I'm sure is very universal that anybody that teaches uh, jujitsu can relate to, um, is the, the guy or girl, but usually it's a guy, that uh, just really, really wants to train. They call up, they want to come by the academy and get some information, really want to train. They've heard about jujitsu and how awesome it is. And, you know, they, you know, more than anything else, they really, really want to train. But that same guy or girl is willing to make zero investment, either, you know, financially, time-wise. You know, there's a whole list of excuses before they ever even step on the mat. They really want to train really bad, but you know, here's all the reasons why I can't train. So, and, so know, I want to hit on a story about that because that, that brings up a really good point. And that is, you know, I kind of told the story, whatever, on the first episode, I believe, Phil, wasn't it? Uh, 
I was going to jujitsu. Yeah. And and um, so I called you on the phone mm-hmm. and uh, I said, "Hey, listen, I am a I am a real fat ass and <laughs> I I want to train, but I need to lose some weight before I come in to train." Right. And I believe the analogy that you may have used with me was, well, if you were going to go take swimming lessons to learn to swim, would you try to learn to swim before you took those swimming lessons? I was yeah. like, hmm, good point. <laughs> Probably good point. something like that. Yeah. And I came in that very day. Yeah. So so I think that's a, a great point, but continue with your Yeah, time. and that's one, you know, that's very common. You know, I, you know, I want to train, but I want to get in shape first. Well, you know, the way you get in shape is you come in and train. If you... You know, the people that are going to get in shape first are ne- neither uh, not going to do either one. You know, right? Um, you know, the, the the reality is, and I get it. You know, jujitsu is not for everybody, hundred um, percent. Um, yes, it is. Now, I think it should be, <laughs> but I understand it's not for everybody. It's not everybody's thing. Um, and some people, you know, come in and they try it out, and you know, they give it a fair fair chance, and maybe it's not for them. Now, when I say give it a fair chance, six months, that's a fair chance. Okay, okay. not two classes. But um, if it's not for you, it's not for you. But, you know, um, the people that want to train are on the mat. You know, there's not a lot of excuses. If, you know, they don't make a lot of noise. They just come in and sign up and get on the mat and show up for class. And that's, uh, that's pretty much it, you know. So it's not a, uh, if you really, really want to train, you know where we're at, you know. And I always say the hardest part, and, and it's true, the hardest part, especially for a brand new person with no experience, is just getting through the door because it can be, Kind of uh, intimidating, you know. Definitely yeah. is, yeah. So, so we talked about that. Did you? Did you? Yeah, I went around the block a couple times. No, I didn't. But I almost walked back to the car. Yeah, the first, <laughs> the first class or whatever. Yeah, kind of waiting outside, and everybody was standing outside. And, yeah, everybody knows each other, and you don't know anybody, and everybody's dressed weird, you know. And yeah. Like, uh, and that's why it's super <laughs> important, you know. And I always stress to all of our our guys that you know when that new person walks in the door, you know, be the first one to come up and talk to them and. And I know you guys are real good about doing that, you know, and, and a few others as well. Um, you know, Landon uh, comes to mind. Landon almost talks to him too much <laughs> sometimes, but you know, the right it's the right intention, you know, of you know welcoming welcoming them into the academy because uh, you know that brand new person that comes in and knows absolutely nothing could be one of your best training partners one day, absolutely. you know. Um, and but if they don't feel welcome or they come in and they're intimidated. Um, you know, they may walk away from it and, and, you know, neither one of you then get the benefit of them training jujitsu. Well, especially whenever somebody walks in and they're around your same size, right? That's what I'm like, <laughs> hey, hey, man, how's Excited. it going? Yeah. Uh, but, but too, I, I think you're right, John. I mean, you, you see it, you know, because let's face it, sharing the mat together, that's an intimate time. And, and you know, we are... We are 100%, you know someone whenever you share the map. Oh, absolutely. And so we get in those, whatever, we start class, you know, if everybody that's been training for a while sits and talks, but I think it is so important that you welcome them in. And I think it's one of one of the reasons why our academy has grown so much, right? Yeah, is that, that we've got that correct <clears throat> culture from top-down leadership in you that says, hey, you know, let's try to make this for everybody uh, and let's try to give it the best opportunity because like you said jujitsu not everyone can do jujitsu i i am going to say jujitsu is for everybody but not everyone can do jujitsu uh, whatever the, their hang-ups are but that gives them the best opportunity to really see because if you're not welcomed into an academy then you know you're probably going to plod your way through the, the class and get out of there and never come again, right? Yeah, that's absolutely. Not what I mean, the, the social aspect of jiu-jitsu uh, is super important, you know, and something that we really can't overlook, you know, both on the mat and, and off the mat, you know? I mean, how often do you get together and hang out with your buddies that you train with, you know? And that camaraderie that you develop uh, on the mat, I mean, literally I have uh, friends from all over the world that I've met through jiu-jitsu, you know, which is what makes it awesome. And um, that's one of, to me, the biggest benefits of doing what we do. Um, and, you know, man, you guys know you've been doing it long enough to know that jujitsu is hard. It's not easy. And there's a lot of days that you're going to struggle and there's days that you're beat up and you're tired and, 
you don't feel like training and what gets you coming in the academy is your buddy you know hitting you up sending you a text message hey you coming to class tonight you know and it's it's that social aspect that um, motivating each other that keeps you coming back into the academy when it's not always you know easy yeah 100 percent I mean you know I can't tell you how many times that me and Phil or Mark or any any of the guys and you know we've got a we've got a messenger chain uh, BJJ group messenger chain where where you know whether it's training or whether it's stupid memes love the memes so that's part of it <laughs> you know you know uh, we share that and it is it is kind of a brother and sisterhood um, uh, what we share uh, so so there's one give us some yeah so um, another one here and again these are not in any particular order just kind of as they came to mind but um, inconsistency you know so this is once you've made the decision to, to train and sign up um, you know uh, you got to get on the mat um, that's the biggest thing if if I had to give any one piece of advice to a new student you know how do you get good at jiu-jitsu show up you know the people that show up get better the people that don't show up don't and um, you know, you don't have to be in there five or six days a week. You don't have to be in there twice a day. But a couple days a week is pretty manageable, particularly, you know, most of our classes are about an hour long format. Um, you know, two hours out of your, your week is not too unreasonable, you know, to just get through the door and put your feet on the mat. And, um, you know, we all have stuff that goes on outside. We all have, you know, lives outside of the academy. And, we all get busy with work and family and friends and kids and you know whatever else um, but you know make it a part of your regular schedule make it a part of your routine put it on your calendar you know have your regular days and you know you might miss a day if you're a Monday Wednesday uh, guy and you you know something comes up um, of course that, that stuff happens you know you can maybe try to make it in on another day at least make it in on an open mat um, you know there's a way to find time to train uh, you know, there were times, you know, I did a lot of, uh, when I worked in law enforcement and did a lot of shift work and, you know, crazy schedules and you had to train when you could, you know, sometimes it was during off times. Um, there was a good period of time where I was getting up at 4.30 in the morning and driving an hour and a half one way to go train at 6 a.m. Um, but you find a way to make it happen if it's important. Um, so, you know. And I would way rather have the student that is training consistently two to three days a week. Three days, I think, is ideal, especially in the beginning. Um, Helps you, you make those connections, right? Yeah, I mean, sure. the, the more time you spend on the mat, the more connections you make. The more you put things together, the yeah. better you get at jiu-jitsu. But, you know, saying that, you know, there are, you know, some of the hardcore guys, um, some of them are in this room, that mm -hmm. are there four or five days a week, twice a day. You know, that's great. If you can maintain it, um, most people can't. Um, the ones that can, I mean, I was one of those that, you know, is an, an exception. Um, and you sacrifice other things in your life sometimes for it, but, um, you know, it depends on how important it is to you, I guess. But I would, I would way rather have the guy that's consistently there two, three days a week over the long term than the guy that's there five, six days a week, twice. You know, twice a day, and I've seen so many of those guys come through, and they get burned out. You know, four, five, six months down the road, you you know, if you don't see them, yeah. they start to disappear a little bit at a time. You know, and it's a it's a very um, recognizable pattern. You know, I can tell when someone's quitting jujitsu usually before they can. Yeah, because I've seen it so many times. You know, so and I would add to that on the two to three days a week. You know, an hour isn't good enough just for the instruction. <laughs> got to stay in roll. Well, right. that's on the list also. <laughs> <laughs> good. That's a good segue. But we got to ease people into it, right? <laughs> you're right. You're right. And, and listen, as an example, you know, Phil, I, I uh, roll shamed Phil into staying his first time. And then he realized that that's actually the funnest part. Yeah, you know, for sure. Of jujitsu. Mm -hmm. right? how long it would have taken us if we didn't do that. You know? Years. Yeah. It's <laughs> not, the fun you know, classes. And, and the way we do it, um, I mean, look, when I started training, it was a different mentality. It was a different, you know, culture. Um, you know, you, you just, 
got fed to the sharks day one. And um, not and, really a and, good and, way to promote and, someone to come back. Though. No, but and you know a lot of people didn't. But the ones that stuck it out, you know, you ended up with a bunch of tough guys. But you know, you just got beat up for six months and then if you were still there they would start to kind of show you something you know and that was how I started but that's not the best way because um, not everybody that comes into the academy comes in as a tough guy but they can learn to become a tough guy or girl you know? yeah for sure they can be developed into that but if if you know if you scare them off you know the first uh, couple weeks you know they're never going to get the long-term benefit of training you and, you know, ultimately that's what it is because the guys that are the tough guys are not the ones that really need jujitsu. The guy that comes in that's already strong, already athletic, you know, they've done you know, sports all their life, they're in pretty good shape, you know, they have confidence. Um, those guys, you know, obviously they can benefit from training jujitsu, sure. of course, but those are not the ones who really need it the most, you know. So we got to make sure that, that, you know, those other people are comfortable and that we work them into that um, into that live training, into that live sparring. Um, but yes, that one is uh, was also on my list of you know those people that don't stay for sparring. Um, man, you have to you have to roll. You know the the thing that makes jujitsu so effective and why it's so respected among all the other martial arts is the liveness of the training. That you know every single technique that we do, we put it in the lab. You know the mat is the laboratory, and we. Uh, we, we put it on the mat and test it out and see where it fails and you know when it fails we try to fix it and you know you learn through failure um, but you have to um, you have to test yourself in that crucible of live training with a resisting partner it's it's super important um, and it's uh, it's completely different than just drilling um, moves with a cooperative partner which also is important of course but yeah you got to get the roll time in and um, you know, again, it doesn't have to be every day, and you don't have to spar hard every day. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, you should be rolling at least a couple times a week for sure. Yeah, totally agree with that. And, and you know, to making those connections, and like you said, drilling is important, right? I mean, you want to you want to be a hundred percent correct in your technique and in, in, in drilling uh, because. Even if you're 50% or more correct in your technique while you're live sparring and you've got the right situation around us, that technique's going to work. Yeah, perfectly. Right. Hopefully. Yeah. The idea of the, the drilling is to perform the technique as, as flawlessly, as seamlessly, um, as perfectly as you can. Obviously, you know, 100% perfection is kind of an ideal that we never really reach, but that's the goal, right? So, mm -hmm. no long, no matter how long you've been doing this particular technique or series of techniques that you know it can always get better um, and if you keep that mindset you know kind of that beginner mindset um, no matter how long you train then you know jiu-jitsu never gets boring yeah know? and I feel like this um, yesterday's class I went from 25% perfect on my triangle to good 28% perfect <laughs> on my triangle I think I took a good three percent step on that in that class it's always good to have room for improvement <laughs> Quitting. You want to make sure you have something to work on. <laughs> no worries there. Let's shift gears just a little bit with um, with that because, you know, one of the great things about, um, and I know Phil and I both help uh, with the kids, about jiu-jitsu is it's so good for kids. You know, I I tell a story with my with my friends. There's, there's some kids that have come in that have started jiu-jitsu. I won't mention any names, but you know, where, where they were looking down, they, you know, they wouldn't look you in the eye. They, they weren't hanging around with any of the other kids or anything like that. And then just after like maybe a month of jujitsu, these kids are laughing and playing with the other kids. They have, you know, you can visibly see their self-confidence improve. Yeah. And, sure. and they just, they come out of their shell and they're, the, it allows them to be the person that they should be growing up to be. Yep. And so um, with that, I'd like to talk about some, you know, because some of the parents of the kids, they listen to the podcast. Mm -hmm. And 
And so, what's your best advice for parents of jujitsu kids? Man, um, <clears throat> you know, this one is uh, this one's kind of tricky. And and I was actually talking to one of the parents um, about this recently um, because you know, I mean, my kid trains jujitsu. I want to see him has been training for a long time and. And, and doing really well, and of course I want to see him do well, and I want to see him succeed and, um, and, and do his best, and that's what every parent wants for their kids. Um, but, you know, the thing you have to realize with the, with the kids um, is the most important thing um, at that age, at the younger ages, is that they enjoy training, that they have fun, and they love jujitsu. Because if they do, then they'll do it for their whole life, you know? Um, I don't need a six-year-old to have a, a perfect arm bar or a perfect triangle choke or, you know, um, so I'm not that concerned about their technical ability. Obviously, the longer they stick around, the better that they will get at it. But, um, you know, one of the things that I see some of the parents um, sometimes do, and they have the best of intentions, but they will actually end up pushing their kid out of jujitsu because they push them too much, you know. Um, the best thing you can do for your kid is number one, get them to class. You know, again, consistency, right? Um, you know, show up, get them on the mat. Um, our kids only train twice a week, which I think is a good pace for the kids because we want them to be able to do other activities, whether it's soccer or baseball or swimming lessons or gymnastics. All of those things are, are good and important, and it's it's good for them to be well rounded. Jiu Jitsu should be um, definitely a part of that, though. And by the way, they're going to be better at those other things if they do jujitsu. Oh, just the mobility, the, their their level of fitness mm -hmm. that they're they're going to experience. You know, just with the the warm ups that we do gives them a good cardiovascular exercise. And so you're going to be, you know, I would say that jujitsu is a great off season off season training for wrestling for just about anything that Everything. involves cardio. Yeah, for life or yeah. agility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, get them there, bring them to class, support them. After class, you know, if, if you hang around, um, a lot of the parents like to hang around and watch class, and that's fine. Um, but uh, just sit on the sidelines. Don't make comments. Don't coach. When your kid's on the mat, they belong to us, you know. If there's an issue we can't handle on the mat, I promise you, we will let you handle it. But we can pretty much handle whatever happens out there. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, don't be that parent that wants to sit on the sideline and coach your kid. Number one, you probably don't know what you're talking about unless you train jujitsu too. And in which case, if you train jujitsu and you've been training long enough, put your gi on and get out on the mat and help out because <laughs> it'll help you too. But in other, otherwise, just sit on the sideline and watch. And then when you leave, don't recap the whole class on the ride home and during dinner. And hey, you know, you really should have, uh, you know, done this on, on that sweep or... You know, I saw when you were rolling with this kid, you know, you should have been trying, like, you know, the only thing that should be is, hey, did you have fun today? Did you learn something? Awesome. Move on. And you let, know? you know, I, I would even go one step and say, if if you talk about jujitsu, make sure that it's the kid bringing up jujitsu. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's, that, I think that's a simple principle that you can follow to where, you know, you're not talking about it yeah. too much or pushing too much or anything, because we see that in in every sport, not just yeah. jujitsu, right? I mean, yeah. you know, those possibly living vicariously through mm -hmm. their yeah. through their uh, kids. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that, and and you know, you'd be surprised how often the kids end up dragging the parents onto the mat. You know, the, the, that. the parents start training because the kids are training, and so yeah, if the if you know if you get home and the kid wants to wants to practice their moves, you know, if they bring it up. Yeah, of course, absolutely support it. You know, uh, man, I remember. Few years ago, Joey was a little younger, and I had just gotten back from working a, a Naga tournament. You know, traveling all weekend, just completely beat up, tired, just wanted to go home and rest. And I got home, and Joey said, uh, "Hey, Dad, um, you want to go down to the academy and drill some moves?" And of course, absolutely. You know. <laughs> Not which really, but awesome. yes, absolutely. Which is pretty awesome, you know, when your kid brings it up and they're the one that, you know, um, um, you know, that's pretty neat. Yeah. So, but yeah, don't, don't push it too much. Um, some of the parents, um, 
you know, the competition side is, is something, especially with the kids, that, you know, some kids do well with it, some don't, some adults don't do well with it, you know, it can be a lot of, a lot of pressure, and I've seen the competition side ruin a lot of good kids, you know, so um, make sure if, if your kid's competing, it's because they want to compete, and that you encourage them and do it with the right mindset, you know, um, win or lose, you know, hey, good job, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to just step out on the mat. Know, especially for a little kid so important yeah. it, take, it takes but, a lot of courage for a little kid it takes a lot of courage for a teenager mm -hmm. for you know what Joey did in uh, in Atlanta to go to a, a professional organization to do a, a super fight you know against another at the, what they were near the same age right a month apart yeah, yeah both green belts in front of a crowd I don't know how big the crowd was but I saw this several hundred arena and it was incredible and to be able to go and do that, you know, I mean, I've, I've competed, Phil's competed. There's nothing easy about competition, including uh, the training going up to it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is very important that, you know, you, you keep a nice mindset whenever, whenever, in a very calming mindset. And I'll never forget this, one of the speakers that we had at a, at a work function, they were ex-military and and they they said calm is contagious mm -hmm. right and that that epitomizes what you are whenever you're coaching even if it's Joey yeah. even if you're coaching Joey on the sideline your your voice never really raises you know maybe a sense of urgency in places yeah. where there is a sense of urgency yeah. but but just having that having that um, calm voice uh, uh, instructing you and in the proper things to do and like you said the outcome is really inconsequential right everybody wants to win but the fact of the matter is if there's 10 people in your in your uh, weight class whenever you're competing you've got a 10% chance that you're gonna win yeah. right I mean that's that's just it yeah and I, and I always tell people you know that, that want to compete that you know um, you know there's benefit to competing um, if, if it's something that you enjoy doing and you want to do it but you know, the reality of what actually happens the day of the competition is not what's important. It's it's all the work and, and you know, the effort that you put in getting ready for it, you know, that makes you better, um, that ultimately is, is what's more important. But yeah, I mean, from, you know, having competed a lot myself and, and you know, ref all over the world and seen a lot of coaching, some good and most not so good, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter, kids or adults, but especially with the kids, you know, the, it drives me crazy to see the coaches that just sit there and, and, you know, scream at their kids the entire match, regardless of whether the kid's winning or losing, um, you know, and, uh, you know, number one, they can't hear most of what you're saying anyway, and ultimately, you know, you can't win the match for them. They have to, you know, you train them the best that you can, and you put them out there, and you know, let them do their best, and you know, it's not the worst thing in the world for them to lose a match. You know, sometimes those are the things that actually teach you the most. You know, so. Um, but yeah, getting back to the the parents, you know, just and just one yeah. other thing on that losing the match. Phil and I were talking about, it. and immediately after the match, if you win or lose, or even after the competition, you know. I'll, I'll say, you know, your friends ask you, how'd you do in the competition? Oh, I won. Oh, cool. That's great. How'd you do in the competition? Well, I lost. Oh, cool. That's great. Yep. Nobody cares. <laughs> exactly. Right? I mean, yeah. you, you care because it's your own little microcosm. It's your own little universe. But not one person cares. Yep. So, yeah, I just think, true. I think that, to, you know, your attitude at, your loss. I mean, you, it, it's easy to be, it's easy to be a good winner, right? Oh, for sure. But it's not easy to be a good loser. Yeah, and but those are the ones that stick with you, you know? Um, I mean, I, I can probably tell you almost every single match that I lost, you know, because you remember those and, and you, uh, um, you learn from them, you know, so those are sometimes even more valuable, but, um, oh, agree. But yeah, just you know, to just to get back to the the parents, you know, bring them to class, sit on the sideline, um, watch if you want, but don't comment, don't coach, don't you know, um, 
don't push your kids too much. Let them just enjoy jujitsu. You know, don't expect them to be perfect. And trust the instructors. You know, you're paying us a lot of money to teach your kid because we're professionals at it. We've been doing it a long time. We know what we're doing. Just trust us. You know, there's there's a process, um, and you know, um, your kid will see positive results. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but um, but yeah, just. Trust us and believe in the system. And that goes not only for the kids. That goes for any of the students, you know. Trust your instructor. Believe in the system. It might not make sense to you at the time. And I remember um, being a white belt, being a blue belt. And, you know, my instructor would show something. And I'm just like, man, I just don't know. That doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. Like, I really feel like I have a better way. You yeah, know? That never happens to me. <laughs> Is that how you feel? Is that not ever? yet. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, always you know, happens, like, <laughs> always. now I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, now I understand why, you know, we did it that way. It makes a lot more sense, right? So you don't have the same perspective. So yeah, trust your instructor, you know. I think, I think that's a really important lesson, um, too, because, you know, like you said, I, just to give an anecdote, I mean, we all have places where we feel our or jiu-jitsu that I remember distinct places where I felt like I was getting better at jiu-jitsu and I want to share one of them and that was you know I think I'd been in it for three or four months I quite honestly I'd just been able to get through the warm-ups you know I mean I, I struggled getting through just the warm-up section and and um and was you know this wrestler who was going a hundred miles an hour for two minutes right the, Total, and I've said it before, it's a total asshole right way to roll. Don't do, don't do what I did, ladies and gentlemen, on that. Because yeah, that's yeah, just, yeah. it's not a good way to roll. And I just remember one day, you and I were, were going together, and I, I, I was just freaking out. I don't know what was going on. You were on top of me, and I was just freaking out. And I was, you know, uh, uh, had a lot of apprehension. And, and at that very moment, you put your hand on my chest. And you go, and, and I'm sure it wasn't hard to hold me down or do anything. <laughs> but you put my, your hand on my chest, and you probably barely had your knees on the floor because my belly was so big. <laughs> but you, you just said, Jeff, just, just breathe, <laughs> just breathe. And, and it was calming. It was consoling. And like at that moment, a light bulb went off in my head. I was like, man, you've got to calm down. You've got to. You've got to kind of be more present and be be better at what you're doing, and not just physically. You just have to be better mentally at yeah. what you're doing, and that really helped me. It didn't it didn't only help me with rolling and not being an asshole anymore. Uh, well, maybe sometimes you know, <laughs> me and Phil talk shit to each other about <laughs> rolling, but that's the fun part of it. But but. To, to really, I don't know, just transform the way I, I, I thought in my critical thinking, not only whenever I was rolling, but when, also whenever whenever I was I was listening to instruction, you know, get diverted and everything else, and you just have to listen to that instruction. Like you said, say, you know, I was like, well, maybe you could do it this way, thinking in my own head. Mm -hmm. But then after I just kind of released that and, and let you be the professor, which is what you are, and the guide along this campaign. Until I did that, I that, or that was actually the seminal moment where I felt like, all right, I've gone on to the next step here. Yeah. And I think it was, I think it was not too long after that where I got my first strike on my white belt. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just it's like you said, so much of it is mental and just learning to. Stay calm under pressure. You know, that's something you hear all the time in jiu-jitsu, but it's, it's really very true, you know. Um, just, you know, having somebody on top of you and you can't breathe and you can't move and you don't know what to do and you panic and you're claustrophobic, you know, it's a terrible feeling. And anybody that's trained jiu-jitsu for a long time, you know, or even sometimes a, a relatively short time has been there, you know, has experienced that. The good news is the longer you train, the less you experience that. You know? Yeah. It's... It's stress inoculation. You know, you you um, get comfortable in those bad positions by putting yourself in those bad positions over and over again, and realizing that you're not going to die. You 
you know. Yeah, most likely. Um, <laughs> as Master Ken said, the easiest, <laughs> easiest move in jiu-jitsu, the double yeah. tap. Yeah, just just tap, you know, if you need to. But, um, but uh, you know, yeah, so much of it is mental, you know, that um, if you just learn to calm down and not panic and think your way out of it, you know, and, um, yeah, you know, you actually – touched on a couple other things that I had on my uh, on my little list there uh, one was you know about being the, the spazzy guy you know um, no nope. obviously you know not uh, not going too hard too fast um, you know the uh, uh, the analogy I always give is you know you wouldn't take a 15 year old kid that just got his furnace permit and take him to Daytona and let him go 200 miles an hour. He's going to hit the wall. You right know? Right here. And it's exactly the same thing when you're a beginning student in jiu-jitsu and you first start sparring. And if you're a big guy and a strong guy and an athletic guy, it's even worse because you're more dangerous, not only to yourself, but to your training partners. So, um, one, it's a safety issue, again, for both you and your training partner. Two, it really inhibits your learning, you know? Jiu-Jitsu is about efficiency. It's not about, you know, accomplishing what you're trying to do through strength and power and athleticism. So, you know, yeah, did you get that sweep or did you escape from that position because you powered out of it or did you do it technically, you know? Um, you might be able to power out of it if you're bigger or stronger. It's not going to work when you're the smaller guy. And everybody's going to be the smaller guy sometime. Yeah. You know, that's the perspective that you have to have. Yeah. So, you know, that... That one about um, you know learning to calm down, learning to uh, just you know stay composed, um, composure. You know um, we talk about that in the our uh, seven five three code you know that we have hanging on the wall in the academy. Uh, Fudoshin, you know emotional balance, and it's something that applies not only on the mat but in in your life. You know everybody has ups and downs. You know don't get super overly excited when you hit that sweep because you you know you get excited and you start celebrating the sweep and you don't stabilize your position and the next thing you know you're back on the bottom you know or you're getting caught in a choke because you weren't paying attention to what was going what the other guy was doing you know and same thing you get caught in an arm lock and you tap don't get upset about it you know obviously nobody really wants to tap the goal of jiu-jitsu is go tap the other guy right but we all understand that you don't get good at this without tapping a lot the tap is an opportunity to learn, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. Try not to make the same mistake consistently over and over again. Learn from it, but it's okay to tap what you need to tap. You know, take care of yourself. Don't get hurt, but you know, don't lose sleep over every single time that you tap the mat because ultimately, you know, jujitsu is supposed to be fun. We got to keep it fun. We got to not make it more stressful than what it already is. It's already stressful physically and mentally and emotionally, but. Um, you know, it should be a, a stress reliever. So, yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think I think too. I think that you have to. I think that you have to talk to your training partners. Yeah. Right. Sure. I mean, if someone, you know, if someone, listen, it, it's important. You're you're sharing that same mat space. It's important that that if someone's doing something that you're not comfortable with, or if they're you know right off the bat going a thousand percent you know to let them know you know after I mean I'll give a for example someone that was going you know a white belt who'd been trained for a while thousand percent off the bat and then I swept them in like a second and a half mm -hmm. and and then afterwards I said I said hey I only mirror your intensity so if you don't go a thousand percent then I'm not going a thousand percent and we're both getting work in yep. to be able to, you know, to be able to accomplish our goals on the mat. Yeah. So I think that's real important. Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to be, you know, that, that guy that goes too hard, you know, that's a very common problem. Again, particularly for the bigger, stronger, you know, natural athletes that come in when they first start training because they don't know anything else. They don't even realize a lot of times that they're doing it. It's just their natural instinct, you know, their kind of survival mechanism. Um, and until they develop a little more technique, that's kind of all they have to rely on. So it, it is tough. Um, um, and it's a consistent problem. Um, but, you know, pay attention because I'm, I'm pretty
pretty sure your training partners and your instructor has probably said to you, hey, slow down, breathe, stop going so hard, you know? You know. It only took me like a hundred times to say that, <laughs> stop. But, you know, some people don't get that message, and then what happens is you end up being that guy that nobody wants to train with. And it's really hard to get good at jujitsu without having good training partners, you know? And so when you start being that guy that yeah, nobody really wants to roll with, and rightfully so because they don't want to get injured, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a problem. And, and I, I alluded to it before, but, you know, I think that if you keep the mindset of that you train 50% for you, 50% mm -hmm. for your training partner, then you've got 100% worth of training there, and you're both getting better. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Phil, you've been awful talkative to yeah, yeah. still here. A lot of the information. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't come in with oh, this. Yeah. All right, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just making sure. Well, you know, actually, it's... Uh, um, Feels kind of quiet anyway, but actually I like that. You know, um, the uh, you know to me um, the guys that uh, you know they just show up in the academy and they uh, you know they come in to train and they work hard and they drill and they pay attention and you know they ask questions at appropriate times, but um, you know they don't make a lot of noise. They just kind of go with the program and you know, man, that's honestly that's that's the best way to be. That epitomizes Phil. 100%. Except he is very talkative. <laughs> you haven't seen that side of him. But we'll sit outside the academy. I know you've seen that for an hour oh, yeah, or for two sure. afterwards just talking about the stuff that we've done. Uh, and believe me, it's not me talking most of the time like it is here. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let, let's, let's take it down a notch. Let's, let's, uh, let's do something fun. Phil, who's the person you'd most like to put on soup? All right, and before before we go on here, this is a, a, a Dustin Dennis. He does um, this segment sponsored by Campbell Soup. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Dustin Dennis does seminars at uh, at the Mothership every year. Great, great content, great drilling. And he's just a funny character, wouldn't you say? He is definitely a character. So, but one of his things was, uh, his sayings, put him on soup. We might make this a regular segment, put him on soup. Because it's, you choke him so hard that they can't eat anything but soup for the next couple of weeks. I think the phrase he used was, uh, so that they have to eat through a straw for the next month. So. <laughs> yeah, Dustin's, uh, Dustin's a funny guy. But really, really awesome uh, jujitsu. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Again, we're not advocating putting anyone on soup, ladies and gentlemen. But if you were to put somebody on soup, Phil... Who would it be? Man, I've told you this since day one. I'm trying to choke you. Yeah. <laughs> I've told you Fair enough. I've said that since Fair day enough. one. You have choked me yeah. plenty of times. It's so much fun. It is. Yeah. I know. Still haven't been on soup yet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> close a couple of times. Tight triangle. Next level <laughs> triangle. Um, but uh, but no, I just thought that was fun. Wanted to put it in there. Um, Phil, for you, what, what was your most fun moment on the map? That's not... Said a map. You map. said You said map, yeah. Map. That's not a realistic question. Why? Uh, I know what mine is, but I want you to go first. I don't think there's not a fun part. That's not a fair I question. know, but there's got to be a most fun part. All right. I would say probably the best feeling is like that, like with the loop choke, you know, we drill it a thousand times. And then you get to the point where I, I was rolling with somebody and I hit the entry to the loop choke. That feeling is really good, right? I mean, I didn't know what to do after that. But right. Just getting there, right? You know, after drilling it for five hundred times, you know, the, that one, that next step is always the best. I think you're conservative. I think you did more than five hundred. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> that, like, finally when it works, when you don't even think about it, you just do it, right? That's yeah. like the best. It's always fun when. Uh, Things start to click, you know? right? John, how about you? Your your funnest time on the mat, like, and it could be it could be you, it could be with Joey. I mean, you mentioned one earlier training with Joey. I think I think that's an awesome experience, one that I'll never have. But to, to be able to to train with your son and, and see the progression, man, he's a killer. As yeah, it is. I mean, obviously, it's uh, I'm really uh, grateful to have the opportunity to. To, to teach him and train with him and, and, you know, spend time on the mat with him. And my older son, Davey, too, you know, he's not 
Um, he's not gotten into jujitsu as much as as Joey has, but you know he's spending his time on the mat, and, and we still mess around a little bit off the mat uh, as well. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean it's uh, it's it's always amazing, and uh, you know watching him from the time that you know he's you know, four or five years old, kind of just sitting on the edge of the mat watching, to now ten years later, um, and uh, he's he's starting to actually uh, starting to actually get good at jujitsu. So there he is. It's pretty cool. But yeah, I mean there's you know like Phil said, it, um, the, the mat's my happy place. So um, it's always it's always good. Um, you know, there's been a couple times though that um, just cool experiences that kind of come to mind. Um, you know, one, uh, um, well, actually, both of these were um, in Brazil. Um, you know, having the opportunity to, to travel down there and, and train, obviously, to the motherland is uh, is a pretty awesome experience and something I definitely recommend for anybody that's serious about jujitsu. Um, and I'm I'm uh, already uh, trying to figure out how I can get back down there sometime soon, but, uh, you know, I had a pretty cool experience. By the way, I'm in on that trip if <laughs> you're taking uh, I'll make people. it happen. Um, but, uh, you know, both uh, training down there and, uh, and um, refing down there uh, in a competition that, um, you know, a um, couple cool experiences that just, you know, kind of stuck with me, you know, um, Steve Hall, uh, Professor Hall, who's my uh, my instructor and uh, the head of Fight to Win, um, and I went down to Brazil a few years ago, I guess 2015, for a, a Naga tournament down there that we were working, and uh, so we spent a good week or so in Rio training at a lot of different academies, and um, and uh, we were over at uh, Gracie Mata, um one night, which is uh, you know that's the academy that. Elio Gracie taught at in Rio. Uh, there's a lot of history there, and it's it's very low key. I mean, you wouldn't even know it was a jiu-jitsu school if you walked by it. You know, the bottom part of it's like an old, uh, like a school uh, schoolhouse or something, and you know, you kind of go up some stairs, and there's a mat, you know, um, a couple mats, um, and uh, you know, Hoyler was uh, teaching there for a while before he moved to the states, and now Holker uh, runs the academy there. Uh, one of Hoyce's uh, brothers there but um and uh you know we showed up and it and uh you know two americans showing up black belts so obviously there's a little bit of a target on your back you know, oh, of um and the night that we showed up it was just uh sparring night so there was no warm-up no technical instruction it's just you know we're going to do 10 minute rounds of hard sparring for you know probably about two hours um, and it was mostly brown and black belts on the mat, uh, a couple purple belts, uh, so it was pretty cool. But obviously, you know, we're we're going hard and and uh, sweating, and you know, it's Brazil, so it's hot. There's no air conditioning, and windows are open. And you know, just I remember uh, in the middle of one of the the rounds, just looking up, and you know, outside the window of the academy, you can see the the uh, Christ statue up, up there on the, the mountain um, from inside the the academy while you're training. Just pretty cool, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I remember another time on that same trip, um, uh, working the tournament. Um, you know, we do a Naga tournament here in the states. Depending on where it is, you'd be lucky to get a chance to ref a black belt match. There's, you know, there's a few that show up. Some of the local tournaments, but not many. But uh, this one that we did in Brazil. Um, it was a small tournament. We probably had 250 maybe competitors, but half of them were black belts. Wow. Which was really cool. And I just remember we were in this old gymnasium and, uh, you know, again, it's Brazil. It's hot. There's no air conditioning. You know, you're sweating. and um, But, you know, it's a pretty cool experience just to get to go down there and, and referee jiu-jitsu in Brazil. And uh, I was refing... Uh, and, and just right before we start the black belt division, um, all of a sudden, like, uh, it starts raining. And, you know, the roof leaks a little bit. So it was raining a little yeah. bit on the mat, you know, and the windows are open. But all of a sudden, like, you just get this cool, you know, breeze coming through, kind of cool everything down. And then, you know, it was just kind of like a surreal experience that, you know, getting to ref, 
you know, all of these black belts in Brazil, you know, in their home country. Um, so kind of, kind of hard to back to the early days of jujitsu, right? I mean, if you, if you're looking, I mean, you're not in this crazy Coliseum, you're just in this building that's leaking water. And, yep. Uh, so, you know, uh, and I mean, I, yeah, we could probably go on forever. Little moments like that, that, you know, for whatever reason, just kind of stick with you and kind of cool. But. For sure. So, so my, I'm going to share mine, and that was, uh, that was up at the Origin Immersion Jiu-Jitsu Camp, and um, Dean Lister was showing a bunch of stuff, and somebody asked a question, and it was on the, uh, the big man triangle, right? Fat boy. Fat boy, fat boy triangle. So he says, you need somebody big, obviously, I'm that guy, right? <laughs> Not as big as I was, but now, still big, but, uh. But, and he takes me, and he goes, and you do this, and, and then you and you take your legs and lock them down. And, and he locked his legs behind my head and slammed them down on my back. And almost immediately, I was seeing stars. And he told me before, and he goes, he goes, listen, tap really early, because this is, and I was like, yeah, no, I'm getting, you're Dean Lister. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> and he, he did that and brought it down on my back, and it was, I almost couldn't, didn't have the opportunity to tap on him because it was just so freaking tight and just yeah, you that head nod. yeah I, was, I was like uh, you're right but it's just it's a surreal moment because man you're so right you meet so many people in this you know getting to getting to meet the person who was responsible for me getting into jiu-jitsu and Jocko Willing there and spend time with him at that immersion jiu-jitsu camp and be able to talk to him and to to just see you know, people say never meet your heroes. Well, they're wrong on that guy because I'll give you a, a for instance. Um, uh, you know, whenever anyone would come up to him, and I'll give you a specific for instance because this really uh, made an impression on me, and I know it did on you too, Phil. And that is that um, Jack Davenport, one of our good buddies, Kevin Five, Kevin Five, uh, uh, roommates. Um, his wife was going through the battle of her life with cancer and Jack told Jocko this and Jocko said, Hey man, just turn around the phone, gave her a beautiful, a beautiful inspirational. And if you don't fight after Jocko willing tells you to fight, you're not going to, because I mean, this guy just, just brought it and he would do that with everything. Like whenever parents of kids would come up and say, Hey, Hey, you know, my kid loved Wade as a warrior kid. And he would say, what's your kid's name? Make a personal video. They didn't ask him to do that. He just did. Yeah. And, and that's incredible. And that's the, it speaks to the type, the caliber of person that you meet whenever, whenever you're doing jujitsu and why everyone should do jujitsu. <laughs> and so before we wrap it up, John, is there, is there anything, uh, social media wise, you know, obviously, uh, fight to win Denver. Um, uh, that's where you're at. Uh, we've got the, the Facebook page, Fight to Win Denver. Um, if you want to come train with us. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, and uh, not just us, but, you know, our whole Fight to Win network of teams. Obviously, um, you know, my academy's in Denver, uh, North Carolina, not the one in Colorado. Yeah. The real Denver. Good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Denver Beast. It's funny because my girlfriend's from the other Denver. So <laughs> we uh, mess around about that all, all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, not just mine, uh, our headquarters at the Charlotte Academy, uh, Professor Steve Hall, um, and then uh, all of our other affiliate uh, academies that we have, um, uh, you know, in Asheville with uh, Brad Hanna. Um, we have our uh, Spartanburg School with uh, Ben Holder. Um, got uh, Charles Nunley down in Fayetteville. We've got the Shelby uh, Academy um, with uh, Webb and Roland and those guys. Um, we've got the uh, Concord location now that uh, uh, Steve is out there quite a bit as well. Um, and uh, so, um, so yeah, you know, wherever you're at, there's a good opportunity. Oh, also, uh, of course, Belmont, our newest sure, affiliate. Sure, Terry. Uh, first First affiliate under under me, uh, Terry Massey, one of our purple belts, um, at the Belmont School. So, um, so you know, wherever you are, there's there's opportunities to get in and get on the mat and uh, and train. Um, 
So, you know, um, we're pretty easy to find. Just Google Fight to Win. Um, and, uh, you know, find your closest academy and get in there and, uh, and train. You know, come check out the class and, um, you know, see if, it's, uh, see if it's for you. That's great advice. Great advice. Philly, any, any parting thoughts you have? Uh, I mean, you were very topical on this episode. I was. I feel like I wanted to give you guys a chance. But obviously, just to thank you for being an awesome instructor and, I mean, having a, I feel like I got really lucky going down and you were like 10 minutes away from me when I was looking for a place to do something. So, obviously, I feel like I lucked out meeting you guys. So, thank you for always being a great instructor and giving me the opportunity to find jiu-jitsu, basically. Well, you know, absolutely, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, uh, I mean, this is really... This is really why I do this is, is you know, I know what jujitsu has done for me personally. So just, uh, you know, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to, to uh, share it with other people. And, um, you know, this was never really my, uh, my plan was to teach jujitsu. Uh, matter of fact, when I was first approached about the idea, I kind of dismissed it completely. Um, but, you know, it's, it's worked out really well and, uh, and uh, man, it's amazing. Um, to see the impact that it's had on, on not only my life, but so many people's lives. And, and that's what really makes it worth, worth doing, you know? So. Well, it may not have been your plan, but I can definitely tell you that it's your calling. I think so. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, just a quick shout out, um, Troy, thank you for the audio help. You know, yeah. folks we're <laughs> listen, we're white belts at podcasting, right? I mean, that's, we haven't even got a stripe yet. This is episode five, right? <laughs> It's going to take a while. But uh, thanks to Troy for helping us with the audio. Uh, it was a big help. Uh, hopefully, hopefully this audio sounds good. Maybe if it doesn't, take Very away that thing. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, if you're not out there doing something to make yourself better, get out there and do it. And jujitsu is one of those things. And that's what we're going to be doing. So keep listening. Like us on Facebook. Uh, give us a review, if you will. We've got a Facebook page, BJJ Campaign. You want to type up the uh, whole list for people because it was, tough, it was tough to get the list and it didn't post it on uh, Facebook for people. We'll get a whole list, yes. That, that we can do another good. episode. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure there'll be many more like that. Yeah. Uh, but, but like us on Facebook, BJJ Campaign Podcast, um, and uh, we appreciate everyone's support. We appreciate everyone's ideas out there. And as always, thanks for listening. I'm about to feed him to the sharks right now. Get him hyped right now. Yeah. You know the ground is up. Yeah. Everybody that trains, you know the game. Yeah. So let's get it. Uh. Slap it up, bump it, and roll. Hey. Yeah, that's the way that it goes. Right. Ain't no better way to better yourself in this game. You're feeling the growth. That's, that's time on the mat. We put in the work. Believe it ain't easy, I know. But we train for the love of the game, the love of the art. Now slap it up, bump it, let's roll it.